You're listening to the OK Dad podcast. Please leave your message for Oh, oh Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Okay, Daddy. OK Dad podcast. Let's start this thing. Can you not put that on YouTube? You're listening to my husband talk a lot. Hey, man. Hey, what's going on, Malcolm? Hey, all good. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Good, good. Nice to, uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, man. Nice to finally get in touch. Yeah. How's things? Oh man, they're going. They're going to kind of <laughs> to kind of kick this off, Malcolm. Uh, where are you at currently? Uh, I'm just uh, below Nottingham in England. Okay. And yeah. and has that been uh, where you've been your whole life there? Uh, no. So I was born in South Africa and then uh, moved over to the UK in '97. Okay. Uh, and then um, yeah, we're in Manchester. So. I, went over to Norwich for a while over to the east end of yeah uh, was in London for a period and now we're up here okay so, awesome well yeah. so growing up in South Africa uh how how long were you there growing up w- was it just you and your parents uh yeah just me and my parents and we were out there till I was seven yeah, yeah was born in Johannesburg okay I, I don't think I've met anybody ever born in South America South Africa. South oh, Africa. South Africa. Sorry, not South America. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see, um, I already yeah. get those interchanged too. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, but no, it's still the same. Um, I've met people, uh, I was in the service, so I've met a couple of people that were in Africa, but uh, I think he was from Uganda is right. what I'm thinking of. And he was uh, he was actually a, a math teacher. He was a professor. Oh, cool. But coming over to the United States, it didn't, none of his credits transferred over. So he was like starting at the bare minimum with me while I was there too, like one year out of college. So man, it sucks that nothing ever transfers over when, yeah. when you need it to. It's but true. It's true. Growing up, Malcolm, with, um, with you and your parents there, what did they do for work? Uh, so my, my mom, she was sort of in accounts, and finance and stuff for a while. Uh, and then my dad was in IT, sort of contracting around IT, uh, which is why we ended up coming over to England, really. Oh, okay. Is that what is that what prompted the move? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Kind of find his work over here, and and here we are. Yeah. What was that transition hard for you at seven years old, or did you just kind of adapt to it? I think at that time it was. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard. I've never really looked back on it that often, but it's uh, at the time, I think it was okay. Obviously starting at a new school, completely new place, you know, kind of leave kind of group of friends and all that at that age. Yeah. I suppose at that age as well, we're quite, um, you know, we're able to adapt reasonably well, fairly quickly. Uh, So yeah, I mean, it was, it was a bit of a transition, but we got there in the end and it was not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your parents had, had stayed married the whole time. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. They're still married now. Still going strong. Uh, my dad's, you know, he's excited just about to retire this month. So, oh man, they're going to go and carry on living, you know? And enjoy oh yeah. Stuff. But uh, yeah, they're still going strong. Yeah. I know that's a, I think that's a big win too, especially for like children and the marriages, having, having a solid foundation to build off of, and seeing that because no matter if you guys move, you know, across the continent or across the world, having a solid parents that are together, you can kind of see that and have something to hold on to no matter where you go or what challenges you're facing. So that's really good that you had that growing up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. When, when, uh, when you went off to um, high school and whatnot, how was that transition to was it was it any different or did you kind of go with the same group of friends? Yeah, see, that's the thing. It's like, so I spent, you know, m- most of my sort of primary school years up in Manchester and then moved over to Norwich when I was just sort of transitioning into high school. So mm-hmm. kind of left a, a group of friends from sort of the primary school years and then uh-huh. had to re- rebuild uh, in yeah. the high school years. But yeah, again, just, you know, I think having moved sort of countries completely uh, mm-hmm. and then having to rebuild from there, you know, it kind of, I already had a bit of a, you know, a bit of an experience with it. So yeah. the time around, it wasn't so bad. 
yeah and, uh you know yeah kind of fitted in and you know you do what you do what you need to do and just ended up uh yeah ending up having good times really I yeah was there for 10 years or so um, okay so, yeah and then yeah, after yeah. after that what did you kind of go into did you start to enter the workforce or what did you do after that yeah so um so after school went to college for a levels over here uh you know studied in photography graphics and art and then um and then just kind of went straight into work after that dabbled in a few bits and pieces here and there for a good while um, and then decided to go back into studying and move to London. So I was around 18 at this time. And uh, yeah, moved down to London, went into study sound engineering and music. Because I've always been sort of playing in bands and stuff and playing guitar and all that kind of thing as well. Although yeah. these days, these days they're, they're, they're not quite used as much as I'd like. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> maybe one day again. I'm sure you understand having, you know, juggling the little ones and stuff. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so at that point, you know, studied that uh, and then actually fell into the whole hospitality industry and uh, was running bars for a good while. Okay. Um, but then at that point, it was kind of, that was where things started to kind of change a lot for me. So moved to London and ended up sort of losing my way kind of thing in terms of not really uh, eating well and, and all this and that. And actually went through a bit of a breakup at that point as well. So that, you know, triggered some of that. So that ended up with me getting to a point where I peaked at one of my heaviest weights as well. How, so, how much did you weigh at that time? Well, that at my peak, I got to just shy of 140 kilos. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, yeah. So that was my, that was when I kind of realized, okay, something was, you know, had to change somewhat. But anyway, at this time, uh, I was running bars and everything at that point. We'll kind of get into the transformation bit later, I suppose. Yeah. But it was, uh, yeah, running bars. And then I started to take an interest and make an effort into sort of my health again. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of sparked me to kind of end up where I am today. So I made this transition of starting to lose weight, uh, getting in better shape and working on myself. And then the natural process occurred to where that became more of a passion rather than trying to just chase a goal, for example, related to just losing weight. Uh, and then, yeah, about a couple of years later, I thought through a couple of years, I started studying around nutrition and fitness and getting qualifications into that and then transitioned out of the, the sort of uh, bar industry uh, and into fitness. And I've been doing this now for just over seven years. Just around seven wow. Years. So you're, you're still... I guess let me go back a little bit before I just run over some things here. But I mean, one of the, one of the most dangerous things I think now, even, even myself, I can see it is the nutrition side of things because that's, that's pretty key. Even, even when I was in the military, I was, I was not looking back on it. Now I was not eating the healthiest at all. Now I'd, I'd stay away from energy drinks. I'd stay away from really bad, I'd say um, candy and whatnot. And I got, I got a sweet tooth. I, like I'll be the very first to admit, like once I start eating, I cannot stop for something sweet. Um, but oh, as, as I, yeah, it, it's bad. And in the military, when I was eating like this, I was probably running anywhere from 20 to 25 miles a week. And then adding on like just the, the regular normal exercises that we would do and the team events that we would do. And I was still eating like that. And my primary meals would be chicken and rice or fish and rice. And I weigh what I weigh now. And I've been on a diet, I'd say diet. Um, it's just the way we eat now on a, on a keto diet for the past two years. And even coming out of the military, it's it, it, a lot of a lot of my body would just hurt, and I couldn't figure yeah. out why it hurt. And my wife, who's a nurse, uh, she started digging into health reasons and whatnot, and she found this diet. And I'm like, I've tried every diet; like diets don't work for me. And we started eating this way, and, and all of the pain just started going away, like inflammation and that yeah, 
And that, that was a big one too. And I was like, inflammation, like, ah, get out of here with that inflammation. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't have that, but you don't, you don't see the ramifications of what you're putting into your body at the moment when, when now you can, if you eat a piece of candy and then 10 minutes later after that, you just feel heavy. You just feel like, ugh, like, I don't feel good. I feel sluggish. I feel slow. And uh, yesterday was my son's birthday. And oh, so, God, yeah, thank you. He's, uh, he's four now. Nice. But, um, or actually today it's his birthday, but we celebrated yesterday. And as, as we were out and about, um, they were trick-or-treating at the amusement park and we got some candy. And then, so, you know, I snuck a piece, my wife snuck a piece. And then all of a sudden we just felt hazy like foggy, like sluggish. And I'm like, you know what? Like it's the candy. And she goes, yeah, people eat stuff like this all the time. Can you imagine that they're functioning like this and they're thinking it's just normal life. And she starts talking because she's in the mental health and behavioral health side of uh, nursing. And then she starts talking. Yeah, well, this is probably why a lot of people have depression is because they're eating like this too. There's probably a correlation to it. So it, as you're in the bar scene and, and, and growing up, especially from that 18 years and on, what were you eating at that time? And then did you even notice that it was something that was bad for your body? Or were you just like me where you're just going about your way like, ah, this isn't that bad? Yeah. So back then it was like, well, I suppose back then as well, zero education around, you know, food categories and all that really. And you know calories and this and that so there was no yeah no awareness of it at all it was just like well food is food you know this piece of food is the same as that piece of food it's just food right mm -hmm. Drink, whatever um never really paid attention to the stuff on the back of the labels and all that so at the time it was yeah just eat whatever whenever you know um and then at work you know we'd get sort of uh, staff food and stuff while we we're on the shift and everything so that would be like a burger here and there or most days to be fair that day, in those days um or something something like that that the bar would serve mm -hmm. so a lot of it was just that and then because we were in the bar you know running bars and stuff we were at closing finishing up about one two then we'd stay for drinks and the whole whole kind of life at that point revolved around the work life and then the kind of the party after the work life if that makes sense yeah so we'd finish the shift and then we'd all you know because everyone that works in the bar scene i'm sure they'll agree like you know it's you have a different kind of social timeline to regular mm -hmm. people let's say because while yeah. someone else is enjoying themselves in normal times you're the one working mm -hmm. so so we would you know be up then for the rest of the night just, you know taking on loads of good old jack and cokes and stuff like that yeah so, but with no regard of nutrition so it was never a never a thought at all yeah and then slowly you know made the transition like start to become aware but you know that's a whole other sort of side of it there yeah but it was yeah we always you know i always uh, to be fair at that point i don't know if you guys have like those little rennies those indigestion tablets Mm -hmm. type things so at that point you know i was pretty much living on that I had heartburn all the time and i was like i don't know why because i had no idea i was really doing much wrong at the point yeah uh but it all all comes back into one you know start cutting that all that stuff out reducing it getting a bit more active and all of a sudden i don't have the heartburn and all that you know so was it was it like a shock to you when you started yeah. to make that transition or was it, was there like immediate, like, Hey, I need to do something now. Or was it more of like, Hey, you slowly started to notice it and tried to taper off from it. Well, there was, you know, it was for a while. It's, you know, if you've ever been at that kind of size or at that kind of period, it's like, you don't really notice it for a long time until all of a sudden you do. And then mm -hmm. once you do, you know, it's, if that makes sense. And then once you do it, it, you know, if you let it bother you, it bothers you a lot. So for a while, I was pretty unhappy in general, you know, like you go out with friends and they can fit in certain places. You can't, they can do things. You can't, you can't buy normal clothes from the shop, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And at the age of like 
20, 19, 20, it's, it's really not that great. So it was, yeah, there was one day really, I was just shopping for some swimming shorts to go on holiday. Uh, couldn't buy any anything in the normal shops and had to go to like a specialist shop for it. And that was it really. That was the next day. I just, uh, just kind of made the, the little switch in my mind and thought, right. Yeah. Uh, and then the whole journey started from there. Yeah. I mean, before, before that day, you know, I'd, I'd had like four, four gym memberships, you know, kind of got a gym membership, been a couple of times, made a slight effort and then had no idea what to do. Didn't see much happening. So I would never go again and so on the same story but that day that was like the like the light bulb just went off yeah i think i think for me the heaviest i don't know what it converts to because i think kilos is is 3.2 or 3.4 uh, pounds 2. yeah 2.2 2. right yeah so uh, for me the heaviest that i've been is 264 right on 265 if i didn't weigh myself that week i'm sure it was 265 and for me in the military, running so much, I was still kind of the same body that I am today. Like very, I was around two, 205 to anywhere to 215. Uh, for some reason, I always carry about 10 pounds of water. Like if I go to sleep and wake up, I lose like eight to 10 pounds, depending on, on how much water I had that day. But I got out of the military and all of a sudden I didn't have to run anymore. I didn't have to do all this physical exertion. So instead of running so much, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to run five miles a week. Just yeah. so I can, I, I, I love running. And the first month I, I just took off. Cause I'm like, Hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to rest for a while. Cause I've been going full speed for the last three years. And I finally went out on a run and then my back started hurting like extreme pain. Mm. And then I had to take like a week off until if it went away and then it went away and I started running again. And, and even then it started hurting like immense pain. And then my knees started hurting and I couldn't figure out why. And every time I tried to do what I was doing before, nothing, nothing at that speed or that, that kind of endurance, but I was just trying to run a few miles. Uh, I would have to take more and more of a break off to where eventually it, it was like four months that I was taking off before I can run again until the pain went away. And I would run again and I couldn't, I couldn't run. And then there were even days where I remember going to the movie theaters with my sister and her boyfriend at the time. And I was limping, but I was so used to just walking this way to, to alleviate the pain on my back. Her boyfriend was like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, why? And he's like, because you're limping. And I was like, oh yeah, mm. I am. And so I, I kept going back to the doctor, to the veterans uh, assistants, the VA and I kept trying to see if there's anything wrong. And they kept doing x-rays and they said, no, nothing's wrong with you. I asked for an MRI. Six years later, I eventually got an MRI and they're like, yeah, your back is messed up. And right. uh, I used to jump out of airplanes and I used to ruck a lot. So the rucks that we would run with um, or I would run with were anywhere from 65 to 80 pounds. And if we did a mission or a training exercise, it would be like 100 plus pounds. And those weren't very often, but I, what I'm thinking is since I did so much running that my back was the, the tinier muscles were compensating for that pain. Cause I didn't feel any of it during it. And I got the MRI and they're like, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing this at all. You should maybe think about a different exercise. And for me, I don't like anything else. I just like running. If I could run all day, I like I would. And my wife ended up getting a, a exercise bike. So I started on the exercise bike and I became addicted to it and I kept using it. And, um, 265 started melting down mm -hmm. all the way down to about like 205. But the caveat to that was we started a new diet and it was the keto diet. Right. And the, the way she got me on board is, well, you could eat hot wings on this diet. And so <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm sold. Like if I can eat hot wings, like, you know, that's what I'll do. So I was eating hot wings for, for the first month before, um, I, I started seeing, I think I dropped 40, 35 to 40 pounds in that first month of just eating, uh, keto and a large amount of it was just chicken. And it was hot wings. Yeah. And the next month, I think, uh, another 20, 25 pounds. And, and I was all the way down to under the weight that I was when I was in the military. And all I was doing was the bike. 
And I started slowly getting off the bike as we started. I was still eating keto and I think I hovered around 220 for about a year and a half. And I haven't been working out and I stayed um, Diet Coke. Diet Coke is still keto, so I still eat that. And then now as I transition more into it too, my wife is like the chemicals that are in these keto things are still not good for your body. They're still not healthy for you. That aspartame, and I'm sure you know a lot more other stuff that's going in all those mm -hmm. all those foods. She's like, they're not good for you. So I kind of started tapering away back at that stuff. But what I've noticed too is like, hey, my back has not been hurting nowhere near as it has before. And I think that's largely attributed to the diet. So one day, and it was about maybe a month ago, one day I was like, you know what, I'm going to start running. So I ran two miles and I was like waiting for the pain to come. It never came. So I was like, let me, let me run another two miles. Nothing came. I was like, okay, let me run another two miles the next day. And so I've been doing, I've been running for about a month and a half now. And um, yesterday I knew we had the interview coming up and I had, I had done it once already. I had ran, uh, I think it was eight miles. I was going to go for 10. I just, I hit eight. And then the other day I'm like, all right, I need to go for uh, a seven mile run. I went for seven miles and I signed up for a, a full marathon this past uh, month. And I'm like, man, yesterday we had that candy. We also got my son some pizza because it's his birthday. And so I had a couple of slices of pizza and I'm like, I got the interview with Malcolm tomorrow. Uh, should I run two miles or should I go run the seven miles? My wife's like, just run two miles because you just ran seven miles like a day ago. I'm like, no, nah. as I start running, I'm like, it's not going to be up to me. It's going to be up to my body. How, how long I have to run. And yeah, I got, I got up to the first mile and I'm like, no, I haven't even talked to Malcolm yet, but looking at his Instagram page, looking at his journey, like I definitely got to run a seven mile run today. So <laughs> last night I was like, all right, let's put the seven mile behind me. So I ran seven miles last night just to be prepared for this interview with you too, to talk about it all. Killed it, man. Nice one. Appreciate so, it, man. Uh, so how's the back feeling after that? So the, the back feels great. It, it was, it starts, starts off with a small little like tweak of it. And then it just radiates all the way down to my leg. But yeah. for the, for the past month and a half, like that's been, that's been gone. And if you, for me, if I, if I were to eat something, um, let's say like that pizza or let's say some candy, like in, in what's a normal quantity to me is not for like a regular person. Cause I got a sweet tooth, but if I were to eat that, your back starts to, I start to feel now what I can see is that, uh, inflammation that we yeah. talk about. And before, yeah, like it was just the normal day-to-day -day living, but now I can see that you can eat a piece of candy. My wife was like, man, now, now my back feels tight. Like it feels inflamed. And, and that's something that I, I do think that nobody, nobody looks at, nobody thinks about yeah. to be healthy anymore, just on, on eating choices. No, definitely. I think with the nutrition side, people, I don't think it's so much even a, uh... A case of them not looking for it i think it's, they're just totally uneducated about it it's not there's not enough importance placed on it in the systems sort of growing up yes you have a few cooking classes here and there but nothing based around like actual applicable uh, positive behaviors towards it yeah so, you know they teach you some food groups and this and that but that's about as far as it goes you know but we all know that if you Google how to get in shape or reduce pain or eat better, you'll get a drop down bullet point list, but mm -hmm. it's really, it's the, the ins and, out, ins and outs of how you apply that to your life, which actually uh, a lot of people haven't had their eyes open to yet. Oh yeah. Uh, I just completely unaware of it. You know, I, I find that even more so speaking to plenty of people regarding this kind of stuff. And it's, yeah, it's not even that a lot of them are aware that they're in, that they're eating unwell you know mm -hmm. doing a detriment to their health it's yeah it's because you know it's the day that the day and age that we live in i suppose now everything is you know fast and convenient and in your face and marketable and, and this and that so it's yeah and if everyone's everyone's following the same you know following the the mainstream they're gonna they're gonna get tied into that stuff as well and it's convenient and no one's got time anymore apparently oh so. yeah do you, does uh does the uk have any type of uh like food recommendation because in america they have that food pyramid that's yeah really outdated here 
yeah, same thing here. There's like the, the eat well plate out here. Um, but it's, yeah, it's fair. I mean, yeah, okay. Most people can follow it somewhat and, you know, have a fairly um, decent diet, you know, if they're consistent with it. But the problem is no one's really consistent with it that much. What uh, is what does the eat well plate look like in the UK? Well, it's it's got like, uh, you know, veggies, a uh, small portion of protein, very kind of almost not enough, um, I'd argue, than, uh, you, than the average person needs. Uh, and then a little bit of the fats and, and sugars and stuff like this around the carbs. So it's it kind of gives you the, the categories, but it's nothing really um, that useful to follow, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Because even looking at the, the one in the US, the, the pyramid, I think like a big portion of that is bread and yeah. your yeah. bread's basically just sugar and carbs. So that, that to me, looking at it, especially now I'm like, Whoa. Cause, cause yeah. I mean, the keto diet, I, I, really. I touch, yeah, I, yeah, I touch a, a very small amount of bread. I'd say in, in the diet from the day to day. And if it is, it's usually something that's um, keto made, but then again, that's when we start diving deeper into it that, okay, it is keto. So it doesn't have it. it the sugars in it are, are the synthetically made. So it's not going to spike your blood sugar, but then yeah. also you're, you're not putting something that's organic or natural into your body. You're putting a synthetic made thing into it too, which is yeah, also, it's isn't it? It's yeah. Too really. I mean, it's like I said, this, uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with carbs at all. I mean, it's, you can take it or leave it really out of the three macronutrients we need proteins and fats to survive but you know carbs is a you know it can come down to a, a preference and whatever works for you type thing but either way you can make it you can make it work whether you go keto or you eat just a fair balanced diet of all three it's uh it's perfectly doable for most people um, obviously of any conditions or anything surrounding it needs to be taken yeah. into account but in most cases what i found is you know often like these diets tend to get labeled for marketability um, when in fact most of these diets are just based around the calorie deficit now there's obviously other benefits to it like you know if you do reduce the carbohydrates you don't retain the water and and so on mm -hmm. and so forth but at the same time depending you know the vast majority of people these days are just looking to sort of get in a better shape and feel better. And if you eat low carbs, then yeah, some people just seem to, you know, some people crash on that uh, and prefer to eat with the carbs in, you know, involved, but they still manage to achieve and actually build their muscle and achieve. Oh yeah. Muscle. Yeah. There's, I had a so, lot of friends that, that were looking at me while I was on the diet, losing weight, like, dramatically losing weight at that point um they were like hey i want to do keto and i'm like well the the first week is not a great week because you're learning your body's learning okay now i don't have all this sugar coming in how do i operate yeah. but after you get past that first week or two weeks like yeah it's been great my mood's been better i've been sleeping better my inflammation is down and this is all with just eating healthier like I haven't even started the bike at that point and yeah. so many people were trying it and they were, they were like, no, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. And, and my thing to them is like, Hey, we're all a little bit different. I've tried every other kind of diet and it didn't work for me. I've tried just chicken. I've tried just rice and it didn't work for me, but this one, for some reason it was working. And I'm like, if it's working, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. Cause I'm feeling better. And, uh, we were, my blood pressure started going down cause I had high blood blood pressure from the military and even through that, my, uh, I had my annual labs with the VA. So I had my labs, um, they were doing a check on my liver and my kidneys. And that was some people's like major complaint, like, no, it's bad for your liver. I'm like, well, I, I do have labs that are actually coming up. And every time I've gotten my annual labs, I just got them too. And it was uh, two years already on, on the keto diet and my labs are fine with my liver so everything is fine i'm like if it wasn't fine i wouldn't be doing it anymore but yeah. it's different for everybody so i even tell them like hey this is working for me i don't know if it's going to work for you or not because yeah. 
the the big one too for losing weight is that I like how you said that uh, that calorie deficit and that's something with a portion size that I take in I don't know I don't know if I if I have been doing that um, but I know running the seven miles and stuff like that doing it like a very intensely I I think what I'm illiterate on is the workout zones and I was trying to see if I can if I can learn something on the workout zones and, and find like my max heart rate and mm. see what zone I should try to be working in, at least to get through the, the marathon. And there's a lot of stuff out there and it's a lot of like contradicting things on some of the zones. I didn't know if you had any insight on that. Yeah. I mean, there is a, a formula to kind of estimate your, your max um, heart rate which is basically just subtract your age from 220 mm -hmm. uh, and that will give you, your, you know, your max heart rate. But it, this is a, again, this is something that I'm trying to put across to most people with the whole, I mean, if you're, let's, let's just put it out there first. If you're training for a marathon, it's maybe slightly different because right. you're training for a performance-based goal uh, and for a specific reason. But for like, if we're looking to kind of, or get into a calorie deficit and then you know hit a certain goal and then the ability to maintain it what initially seems like a good plan of chasing exertion through exercise will eventually kind of shoot most people in the foot uh, because the chances of being able to sustain the amount of activity that's going to warrant that, uh, that calorie deficit mm -hmm. uh, it's just not going to be sort of doable realistically in the long term because you'll have to do a lot of it uh, the way I like to put it is, you know, let's say you've got um, a, a meal of 400 calories or not even a meal. It's, you could quite simply eat 400 calories uh, in a bar of chocolate, you know. Yeah. So and that would probably take most people anywhere between sort of three minutes and maybe 10 to 15 minutes, you know, to finish that. But if we kind of use the logic of chasing exertion through exercise, to burn that amount of calories, we'd have to be on a treadmill for around an hour. So just to have 400 calories, we'd have to spend, you know, an hour on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. So going by that logic, you'd have to pretty much live on the treadmill just to eat your food throughout the day. Yeah. So the best, you know, the, the kind of the, the strategy uh, that's best that I found for long term, and this is the one that I've kind of adopted as well, is not... Uh, sort of using exercise as a way of burning calories to get into a calorie deficit, but more so as a way of, you know, building strength, performance and getting stronger, which will ultimately build the muscle. And then the more muscle you have, not saying you have to get bulky, but the more muscle you have, the higher metabolism is going to fire, mm -hmm. in which case just sitting down, sort of talking to you right now, my body will be burning way more calories than it was let's say seven, six, six, seven years ago when yeah. I had little to no muscle, but high levels of body fat. So then in the long term, you don't actually have to do the amount of activity uh, in order to warrant your calorie deficit if you want to be in one, because mm -hmm. you'll have boosted your metabolism, if that makes sense. No, it does. So, yeah. So instead of chasing, like, say, like with your running, for example, you could, if you enjoy it, and for example, for me, on the bicycle in the mornings, I enjoy going on the bike for 30 minutes, but not for the intent of getting a sweat, you know, chasing calories or heart rates or fitness sort of ranges and whatnot. Mm -hmm. More for the psychological benefits, the morning routine, the structure, the discipline. Uh, it gives me the time in the morning to set myself up for the day instead of roll out of bed and have to deal with something immediately. Mm -hmm. So those are the benefits that come through that. Whereas if you have to chase it every day for the sake of trying to hit a fat loss goal, uh, the, the reality of it is you'll just burn yourself out to a point where you just end up falling off uh, completely. So in your case, if you like running, yeah, go running for a few days a week to enjoy it but don't use it as a way of trying to be in a calorie deficit. Use yeah. your, your natural behaviors and habits in order to work, you know, to get yourself to that point with nutrition. Yeah. You can control the nutrition long-term. It's the, 
there's only there's a, you can only ever do more activity if you want to burn more calories if that makes sense no it does i think i think that's where a lot of people that hey like i need i need to lose weight or i need to get in shape the but i don't want to change my eating habits or i don't want to change what nutrition i have coming in i think that's where a lot of them struggle with too because yeah. from personal experience if you're eating healthy that's going to be the first thing that's going to make you feel better and then yeah. I like how you, you say to use it to keep that discipline and that structure, because it does after, after you're doing it for so many times, like you're going to enjoy getting up and yeah. doing that bike ride in the morning, 30 minutes. And then if that's, that's going to be uh, in your case, it's probably not. But in most cases, if you get the toughest part of your day knocked out, whether it be a run or a workout, even if it's a 30 minute workout, yeah. um, doing squats, going outside, doing your walk. And you get that done at the beginning of the day, the rest of your day should be easy. If, if that's yeah. the only workout that you have, and then it brings in that discipline, it, it brings in that muscle memory to where you're like, all right, let me wake up, let me do this. And you do, you feel a whole lot better after you work out. Yeah. Than, than I mean, when you, did. Up the day, you know, you, you make that decision to, uh, to say, let's say you wake up, you don't feel like you want to go and do your workout or whatever it is, but you, you kind of force yourself into it somewhat uh not in a negative way but you get you manage to get yourself out of bed to do it you know you come away from that with a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment which leads to better decision making thereafter so mm -hmm. chances of you then going coming out of your workout and thinking all right let me just go and skip breakfast or let me just go and get mcdonald's for lunch or something like that uh, becomes a lot less likely because you started with a successful part of your day so oh, it's the yeah. hardest thing maybe that's you know going to happen in your day you get through that but you you know you succeeded at accomplishing that goal of just working out for the day which means you're going to want to you know uh what's it kind of benefit yourself further throughout the day by making better choices towards your foods which as you said earlier you know it's the first step to just feeling better really mm -hmm. is oh, your yeah. food so you know if you can have this kind of butterfly effect throughout your day where one decision at the beginning is going to spark this this mm -hmm. like momentum through your day and you can continue to keep that going that's that's really the key to you know staying healthy fit uh, and being totally consistent with it and again with that comes discipline and routine and and then resilience because there are days where you just don't want to do it but you yeah push on you know? I feel like I feel a whole lot better when I don't want to work out and then I end up working out and I end up going longer or harder or whatever it may be at the end of that workout. I feel way better than just a regular day where I get up, I go running or I work out. That's weird. That's weird how that happens because I, it, it goes to the part to where you're saying you're forcing it to happen. You're making yourself getting up, get up to go do it. It's that discipline that you're instilling in yourself to do it. I feel, I feel way better during those days where I don't want to do it at the end of my workout than a, a normal day. I don't know if you feel the same way or not. Like, oh man, I'm only going to do this. I, I really like how your post yesterday, how you had 10 clients that went through and then you got your workout in. You're like, nope, I still got to get my workout in. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I said, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I was speaking to someone yesterday, actually, just on that, because um, I was telling them, right, I've got, you know, I've just finished up the, the day of all the clients, and uh, it's time for me. And then I've still got the sort of two-hour drive home after that. Um, and he was like, oh, you're actually going to, like, stay in and get it done? It's like, yeah, well, the thing is, you know, Saturday, Sunday, those are the days, really, that I dedicate to spending time with the little one and the family and stuff, for the most part. So I don't really want to have to disappear to go to the gym and have to train at those on those days. So, you know, yeah, the answer is I'm going to get it done today, basically. Yeah. Um, because there was no chance for me to do it in the morning. But for me, I'm, I'm very used to this kind of structure. I've set myself up in a way where over the past, you know, few years of competing in, in sort of competitions and whatnot has set me up with this sense of discipline to be able to maintain it. And I'm not, you know, I'm past the point. I was definitely there for a good while, but I'm past the point of, um, yeah, of 
of not wanting to work out if that makes sense mm-hmm. so that would you would you say that it was not a struggle but difficult to get to this point before you felt like you're you're there or do you think it, it that was even a struggle in itself getting to the point to where you're building that discipline to where you are now yeah i mean it was from the beginning it was it was always a struggle because i was i was never into fitness like I was never into sports. I mean, the closest I got to sports, and it, it is a legit sport, but skateboarding. Mm-hmm. You know? So, oh, that's, that's a major like leg workout. I, w- I wish I was coordinated so I can do skateboarding. I, I found a skateboard and I was like, I want to learn how to skateboard. The, the amount of core strength that you need and legs on that to just go. Yeah, that's, that's not a joke. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, you know, you don't even really think about that. And, you know, it's more just about skating and partying and hanging out and, and stuff like that. So that was as close to sports as I ever really got. I'd play a bit of rugby here and there. Um, and then when it got to the point, you know, where I started to lose weight and get myself back in check, really, that was, yeah, that's where the struggle started because I was just, you know, like everybody else, it was, all right, I've got to go to the gym. I don't want to go to the gym. Oh, I should have the salad instead of the double cheeseburger or whatever, you know, and every day for a long time was a struggle. And, but there was, like I said earlier, I had this, this sort of light bulb moment where or like it just went off where it was, yeah, I just, I set myself straight from that day and um, committed to it. I think you need to have a, like a clicking point to be able to commit strongly because you know there's there's plenty of guides out there there's plenty of coaches and this and that mm-hmm. to help you but until you take responsibility for it you know everyone can give you all the answers but you know you can take you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink type thing oh yeah so yeah it was yeah a big struggle having to go to the gym i would go to the gym after my shifts i would take you know like i said we would normally have like drinks and stuff after work uh, and I used to I started just going right two nights out of the week I'm going to go to the gym instead of stay behind and have drinks you know start to see progress shirts got smaller this and mm-hmm. that um, and then yeah once you start to see that you start to see the value and appreciate the value of what you're actually doing oh yeah and that's, when it, that's when it becomes a bit easier but even then you know, that was at that point, I wasn't lifting any weights or anything. It was just a bit of cardio at the gym. Mm-hmm. I, would, you know, I used to hit the gym. I was put the hoodie up, hide in the corner, make sure no one could see me. That kind of person. Never, yeah. you know, that was it. And uh, yeah, so getting up, going to do a full shift and then, you know, forcing myself somewhat to go to the gym at two in the morning. Uh, yeah, it was a task. And I did that for a good few years before, you know, transitioning careers in where I wasn't having to, um, you know, go to the gym after a full on shift running the bar. Yeah. Uh, but then after that, I decided to go into natural bodybuilding, which required just as much sort of discipline and extreme mm-hmm. training towards it. So I went in, yeah, I transitioned from one hard struggle to the next. Yeah. <laughs> But through those years, you know, the, the skills of discipline through making myself go after work mm-hmm. really sort of reinforced my position when I came to committing to, say, preparing for competitions. And, and, and was it during this time, your little one? How old is your little one? Uh, she's just um, she's going to be 16 months. Yeah. Oh, OK, so you just had her not too long ago. Yeah, last year. Yeah, oh, right. Wow. It's a lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. with with that, having having a little one too, is it is it difficult trying to make time for her? Or is it kind of easy and you're just like, I have the discipline down. I know where I can fit all this time and, and dedication to with your working out and your bodybuilding to then transition to now I have a daughter. Yeah. So again, I I kind of put it down to the, from the start of the journey of of applying myself from that point onwards uh, and building these sort of disciplines, getting into the skills of meal prep and organizing like nutrition around that, 
Um, you know, if you go back on my timeline on Instagram, you'll see, you can go all the way back to the beginning. You'll see me from the start pretty much. Um, well, from the start of when I decided to start documenting myself, because I don't have mm -hmm. anything really, because uh, I hated myself that quite a bit at that point. I don't have any photos or any anything from my peaks other than what people have taken of me. Yeah. So, but my Instagram pretty much goes all the way back to the start of when I was nearing the first sort of journey of losing that weight. And uh, yeah, it got, you know, there was meal prepping. We started applying these things. And the more you start to see these sort of changes, you make more effort. But that then got me to sort of naturally sort of transition into the competing side which kind of it required an extra level of discipline uh, and structure to it uh, but because I already had a bit of a foundation from just getting myself in shape from the, my sort of peak weight that was already quite an easy transition somewhat yeah so, but that's also you know th at that point for competing you know I was I was having to be up at sort of 3 30 4 in the morning do an hour on like a treadmill or whatever then I would train on my clients uh, and in the middle of that would be a two-hour weight session uh, and then towards the latter half of like the preparation there's another hour of the cardio on top and that was six days a week of training involved and then seven the, the seventh day would just be the cardio so two hours of cardio yeah not to mention the nutrition and running a business at the same time so mm -hmm. that really required you know, strict discipline, structure around my days, you know, I was really, I would put everything into my diary so that everything was accounted for uh, and on point. But that also now having the little one, and I was, I was actually having this conversation with a client recently, uh, talking about the benefits of prepping your meals. And so because we, me and my wife were already in this structured pattern of Sunday evenings, we put some music on we'd cook together we'd make our meals for the week and uh we had this thing going it was just our general struck like routine even when we had the little one and my wife was in the hospital with her for two weeks and then obviously coming home and as you know like with the newborn sleepless nights and all of this mm -hmm. but we already had such a strong sort of foundation behind our nutrition and activity set and we've had it for years now that actually when we brought her home we never missed our nutrition we never fell off track we you know we and the thing is it's not like we follow a diet either you know it's just we never sort of had to deviate off our behaviors because yeah. they're just so ingrained now and uh yeah so the structure the discipline came from the training side uh which really made the transition into having the little one in our lives that little bit easier than than most I expect but in terms of finding time using the skills that I learned back there it's uh, you know it's applicable to this which is why fitness just draws so many parallels to other aspects of life oh yeah so you know like having to structure training nutrition around work back then means that now structuring my training and, and all that stuff around hanging out with the little one and going to work and all of this is it's really not much different to how my life's been for the past seven years already yeah so yeah I mean it has its tough days don't get me wrong I mean yeah we all do, you know? um but for the most part it's it's like cruise control now and that's that's ultimately my goal for most people that I you know work with is to get them to a point where things like nutrition and fitness and stuff like that shouldn't be this massive sort of barrier constantly having to be fought against it oh, should yeah. just be something that's ticking over in the background that you can then apply mental energy to other more important things really yeah you know yeah it's, and i i think even with that too like uh how you mentioned y'all really don't have a diet but i know y'all make some really clean decisions if somebody gave y'all a candy bar or some nice chicken that's, that's prepped right <laughs> yeah y'all are gonna pick <laughs> the the better one that's better for your body and when i do like how you you dedicate time now to your wife and your daughter too because especially running a business nutrition uh having this exercise routine that you have 
all all the time because I would say that it's not just while you're in the gym, but like I said, even eating healthy too, it, it takes discipline. So to even have that time set aside that you have for them and granted when you're coming home and, and you're there at home, you're still spending time with them when, you know, during the, during the work week. Uh, but that having that time set aside is, is really good. I, I usually tell people when you want to do something important, don't prioritize like what is important. Like you shouldn't, in my belief is you shouldn't say, Hey, my family's important. So uh, I'm going to do this with them. And then the next thing is my hobby and my hobby's important here. What I, I think you should do is say, Hey, time, time is short. I don't have a lot of time. So time's what's important. And then the most important part of my day is going to be between the morning and 12. And whatever's the most important to you is going to fall into that important time slot. So it, in, in my case, it's your, it's your family. So for me, from that eight to 12 spot, the most important time of my day, I'm going to be spending with my family. And then maybe 12 to one, um, the next important part of my day is that time. Uh, okay, I'll spend an hour on my hobbies. And going that way, because if you if you prioritize your time first, everything that's important to you is going to fall into there. Now, there might be things on the back end that you think are important, but they're not they're not going to fall into that time spot. You were just saying like, oh, OK, this is the time my show comes on. So I need to watch it. Right, when right. In actuality, it's really not that as important as being with your daughter, or being with your son or being with your wife during those times. So I, I love that you prioritize your time. And not just the activities that you have. Yeah, I mean the time of prioritizing your time and scheduling your time is it's one of the keys to just being able to juggle and spin so many plates at once. Mm -hmm. uh, because it can be so easy to get lost in your day or uh, get overwhelmed by having loads of things to do and ultimately having nothing, you know, getting nothing done. You know, it can be very easy to fall into those traps. Whereas if you just spend a bit of time like you said, you know, prioritizing certain times of the day for certain, you know, importance uh, and just getting organized around it, you'll find that actually you can get so much done and actually you have so much time. Whereas I've also been in the position where I'd say yeah. I don't have time, you know, I, I, I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to cook. I don't have, we've all been there, but the, rea <laughs> the reality is we're not all that busy. We have time, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, uh, the favorite show comes on at 7 p.m. So I don't have time to cook. No, the reality is you could probably watch that on a replay later. Uh, <laughs> you do have time to cook. You know, yeah. it's it's just, it, it comes down to, I suppose, a matter of perspective and priority. Uh, but then that, that, that usually loops back to the lack of awareness, you know, towards the priorities. Because people these days are kind of, yeah, they're all, you know, everything's geared towards TV or, social media or this so that becomes a priority whereas yeah. things like nutrition get caught on the back burner uh, and we just reach for the convenience which is yeah one of one of the you know we all get we yeah. all fall victim to the to the clever <laughs> the marketing yep. exactly yeah and that's that's the way it is but um if you can organize your time i think that will like i said earlier in terms of getting a butterfly effect through your day it's um if you can get that organized, that's going to set yourself up for the week to have time for your family, have time for your workout. You know, I don't train six days a week anymore, yeah. the, but I'm at a point where I know how it works. And I try and put this across to others that you don't need to train six days a week to maintain it or get fit. You know, you can train two, three days a week and that, that will do the job perfectly well if you approach it in the correct way. And yeah, you know, I've kind of lost my train of thought with that, but it's, it's one of those things where you don't need to overdo it with exercise or anything oh, yeah. to stay, stay into it. You don't need to overdo it with business. You don't need to overdo it with nutrition or whatever. If you can just get this fine balance and everything ticking over consistently, you know, it all fits into place. You get time for everything, family, health. Oh, yeah activity social it's, it's all there you just have to organize it what do you since since you are a, a like a fitness coach malcolm what do you say to the people because i i feel like there's quite a bit of them out there that say 
hey, I can't do this. Or um, the only reason Malcolm got through this is because he's different. He's special. He's got that extra something, that secret sauce. I don't have that. Well, how do you get those people to try to, or, or do you try to motivate them? And, and how would you get them to take a look at themselves and say, okay, this is going to be for me, not for anybody else, because my wife's also done that. Um, you hear parents say a lot, like, I'll take a bullet for my kid. And my wife's thing is usually she rolls her eyes. She did this yesterday. Somebody said, uh, I'll take a bullet for my kid. My wife rolls her eyes like, okay, but would you, would you live for your kid? Would you go out and exercise so you can stay healthy for them? Would you, would you be there for their grandkids so you can play out in the yard with them and run around? Because that's going to be more valuable to your kid than taking a bullet one time in a hypothetical question. But w- what do you say to those people that are usually like, hey, um, I can't do this or I don't have that kind of discipline or I can never achieve that or I'm too busy? Is there any words or thoughts that you try to let them know when they're coming at it so defensively? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 first of all, I find having to, you have to kind of dig a bit deeper beneath the surface with, with, you know, people it's on the surface, they say, I don't have the discipline or the want or anything, but they haven't really investigated their goal that much, you know, and, for us to just say okay i want to lose some weight yeah that's not powerful enough for us to get up on those tough days it's not it just simply isn't you know it's it's not powerful enough to stay consistent or to say you know to say that you have the discipline to achieve that but if you dig through the layers of that goal and you kind of find the triggers to why they want to lose the weight that's that's where you start to you know come to these realizations and these things start to become really start to open doors and that's where you start to you know realize okay um i need to do this or Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is the more you come to the realization of you believe you need to do this the discipline and stuff naturally comes through because the want and the need for you to do it is so personal and deep you don't even have to, you know, most people won't share that. You know, yeah. It may be really personal to them, whatever the trigger is to the top level surface of, I want to lose weight. So whatever that fun, that little sort of spark is at the bottom, that's what people need to discover and really dig into in order to unleash this sort of discipline. Cause we all have it, you know, it's no one's special. We don't all have like, like you said, a secret source or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like, hell I was not I was not that disciplined you know going through school and and all this and that yeah you know I was me and homework and stuff like that was not not a thing really and and that's where that's where I I believe exactly the same thing too because I don't I don't think there's anything extra special about me but I am a 30 year old dad of three and if I can run a marathon and I can put I think I'm going to be two months, maybe two and a half months when I decided like, Hey, uh, let me start running. Let me see if I can do this marathon. But if a 30 year old dad can do it, I feel like all the other people around that age group or that have something saying like, Hey, this guy's doing it. Like you can do it too. In in a sense, because I, I think when we do that, when we give labels to people, we're, we're, we're doing that. So we can just tell ourselves like, it's okay that I can't do it. Malcolm's just, you know, he's oh, just, well, yeah, he, he's, he's a beast. I can't do it. Um, you know, he's got that extra. But, you know, it's, it's very easy to, it's very easy to look at being in that starting position. It's very easy to look up at people like that. I mean, I used to do it as well, you know, but you know, also you've got to realize that when you're in that position, um, you know, you're not, you know, filled with confidence you're not you're not going to put yourself out there and this and that but it's you know you're more lacking that confidence you're you're in a position where you don't feel happy with yourself you're in a position where you you know you may not be living the most healthiest lifestyle which you know you may not know it but that's what's causing most of your issues Mm -hmm. so it's very easy to then disregard yourself and just totally say well I can't do it but if you look back at like myself back then 
I was also at a point where there's no chance I can do that. I had literally got to the point where this was how I was. This is, I was born to be like this. Um, like I would, you know, I could look at the guys that have six packs, like that just walk around and be like, cool, that's, that's them. <laughs> this is me, you know? Yeah. And I was ready to settle for it until that one day when I had that click, you know, and it was something as simple as buying those swimming shorts or look, trying to buy some swimming shorts that really struck a chord with me. Uh, and it kind of hit home and I was like, you know, Oh, I'm like 20 going on 21 and I can't even shop in a regular shop. I mean, what kind of life is this? And it's a bit like you said there earlier with your wife. I really like that about, but would you live for your child? And it's a big thing that I'm for. And this is why we have like a small home gym set up. Mm -hmm. so that the little one can see us active, can see us getting stronger, working on ourselves pushing through the hard days to to kind of continue to develop so that she grows up with that perspective with the the behaviors of yeah being healthy fit eating well positive life behaviors is just the normal thing for her and you know anyone can do it but the point is you need to dig deep to the point where you have that trigger because until that point you know any, like I said earlier, you could Google how to do it. It will mm -hmm. tell you the answers are everywhere these days with social media and the internet. Yeah. So there's, there's definitely no shortage of step-by-step um, -step instructions of how to do it. But until you personally take responsibility for that decision uh, by having something, you know, having your why, you know, you would have come across the why. Until you come across that, it's, it's going to be very difficult to maintain these short lived bursts of discipline and consistency. Yeah. Because it comes and goes. And it's, most people rely on motivation for this, but, you know, motivation really is, is totally useless because motivation is a feeling. It's going to come and it'll be there for a couple of days and it'll go. And if you try and build your life and your health around motivation, it's, yeah, it's simply not going to be sustained. It's gonna, you're going to end up in that yo-yo diet cycle or that fall-on yeah. fall mentality. But we're in a day and age where things like YouTube and stuff have tons of motivation. So most people are straight to motivation first, looking to get discipline through motivation when actually, you know, discipline comes through committing to the tough parts and finding your reason to do it which is powerful to make you get up in the day to then enjoying the burst of motivation. Oh yeah. You know, the motivation is the times where you, instead of just ticking over with good habits, motivation is where you can then go, okay. Uh, so I normally train like this. It's like you said earlier, I normally train like this, but I'm pretty motivated this week. So I'm going to try and do a few personal records on the lifts this week. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where you can use motivation for your benefit. Whereas I like short, that. Yeah. You know, short lived motivation reliance is going to get you two to three weeks down the line. Your motivation is going to drop off, and then so are you. It needs to be spun on its head. But oh, it's, not really yeah. gets, it's not really a message that gets put out there. Yeah. Um, because motivation is so easy to create. I just put up a really cool video on YouTube or Instagram, and everyone's motivated, but no one sticks with it. Yeah. that That's one thing, too, because I, I think there's a lot of people that aren't able to create their own self-motivation. So that's also what could be damaging. If um, I, I like running with music, but for the marathon and stuff, I'm not trying to train with it all the time. Uh, yeah. So I'll listen to books or I'll listen to a podcast because it'll, you're not going to be going faster than you can. You're kind of just at a pace. I like to be running to where I can at least have a conversation. I've always had that in my head. Like, uh, if I can carry on a conversation while I'm running, then that's where I want my like stamina to be at. I don't want to be at a full on sprint for seven miles. Like, yeah. I think the most I would be able to do is, is like a two mile full on sprint. And even then it's, it's nowhere near what it was when I was in my twenties, but being able to just keep stamina is where I'm trying to be at. But if your headphones die or 
all of a sudden it starts raining or the weather changes or now you step in a puddle and your shoes wet like how do yeah. you can how do you maintain that that motivation with you if your music goes out you step in a puddle and then it starts raining like not, not all, all of that's going to be there but you're going to be with yourself your entire life so when you're going through struggles you're not always going to be able to rely on like youtube or your music or yeah. whatever it is that motivates you so i i really i like that because up until now i really haven't heard anybody talk about motivation that way too to where the discipline is what you should focus on and when you have that use that motivation so i think that's really key that that's yeah i like that i'm gonna start incorporating that too thanks yeah i mean it's i have this sense of well it's, try to put across this you need to have a baseline uh and your baseline is if you just imagine, you know, each aspect of life, whether it's nutrition, your activity, your health, your work, your family, and you want them all to be sort of tracking a nice sort of consistent line with the odd peak and trough because that's life that's going to mm -hmm. happen. But, you know, you want to be able to get them all in harmony, so to speak. So if you can, let's just talk on the nutrition and activity side of things. You know, if you can get yourself to where you're at a consistent baseline, which is, you know, you're consistently eating the right foods for your body each day, depending on what you're trying to achieve, whether it's just maintenance, you know, just being generally healthy or you're trying to work for a muscle gain or fat loss or whatever it might be. Either way, you want to be in a point where you've got baseline set so that when you do get to a point where, Let's say if you are trying to hit a target weight, you know, and you do go out for a meal that's off plan, let's say, or off what you would normally do, you don't then freak out and, and kind of go sort of up, then go out, overdo mm -hmm. it, and then you, you end up kind of on this kind of line, right? This yeah. Consistency. Whereas if you start to look at the baseline set and then you go out and you fall back to your baseline, regardless of what's happened, the big picture of it is, you know, it's going to look like that and it's going to have big, steady, consistent periods. Whereas if we just try and rely on the motivation side, it's going to constantly be up and down. And that's where most people, you know, fail to get to where they want to be because they're constantly on the motivation. Mm. Discipline is going to create that, that yeah. sense of consistency that comes through. And then, yeah, you know, with everything, whatever you do, as soon as that motivation comes, run with it, do what you, you know, push harder, you know, cook oh, a, yeah. a more exciting meal prep, um, launch uh, an exciting project with the business, you know, whatever the, the motivation is attached to, mm -hmm. that's when you can, you know, let it flourish. Oh, yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. Well, Malcolm, as we, as we kind of close this out, Man, I usually end it the podcast with uh, one final piece of advice. So if you if you had everybody listening, all the moms, all the dads, all the people that are saying like I can't do that, what would be one final piece of advice you would give them? Um, so first, just relax with it. Don't overwhelm yourself with it. Uh, you can do it. Just figure out what's important to you. Uh, for example, with me, it's teaching the little one uh, and setting her up. Uh, for a good sort of healthy successful life so they learn from us so if you can uh, portray you know the successful positive behaviors for them to learn from you know find your importance and and work with that use whatever's important to you to develop your discipline your habits your behaviors and uh, and yeah you can do it you will get there awesome malcolm i appreciate it man thanks for coming yeah. on Thank you very much, dude. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great to be on. Thanks. Awesome, man. Oh, I appreciate man. it. We'll be in touch. Nice one. Cheers, dude. Hello. Have a good day. Take care. What are you listening to, Asher? That podcast.